I get to school and my teacher sits the class down and specifically talks to the friends of my friend, um, those in whom were very close to him. It was me and another guy in the class that were very close to him. And uh, she tells us that he had passed away. My mouth just dropped. And so here I am still coping with my parents' divorce, my grandmother's death. I already felt depressed and suicidal, but after my friend died, I began to hear words and, and voices in my head telling me, your life is worth nothing. You should kill yourself, you're worth nothing. And so I got on my knees and I grabbed the knife and I put the knife on my wrist. And all of a sudden, Right when the knife was on my wrist and I was about to slash myself, I heard a voice say, stop. So growing up, I grew up in a two-parent household, my mom and my father. Um, I had great parents, um, my mom and my dad. Uh, they would take my sister and I to church every Sunday. We were on the usher board. We were in the choir. We were very active in church, like, Bible study, um, youth nights, uh, Sunday school, Sunday service. We were probably in church Monday through Sunday. Maybe Friday nights were like the only nights that we weren't in church. So I grew up in the church. I knew of Jesus, but I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. And I remember going home and kind of seeing my parents argue and this and that. And that was normal in our household. You know, um, there was a, some division and some dissension um, within my parents' marriage. And so when I was 10, uh, my parents got a divorce. And so I went from a two-parent household, seeing my uh, father every day. I was a big daddy's girl when I was younger. I mean, I just wanted to be under my dad every day, all day. And I remember uh, during that time in which my parents were getting a divorce, I remember going upstairs and, you know, seeing my father on his knees crying out to God to save his marriage. And that was really different because I was 10 at that time. And some people may say that a 10-year-old doesn't really understand the magnitude of what's going on, uh, but that couldn't be further from the truth. And I just remember kind of, in that moment, seeing my father on his knees crying for God to save his marriage, that's when I knew that things were going to be different. And so when my parents got a divorce, uh, my dad moved out, and I went from seeing him every day to seeing him every other day to seeing him on weekends to every other weekend. And then, you know, it began to get minimal as I, as I grew up. I was living with my mom and my sister— that year that my parents got a divorce, I uh, went down to spend the summer with my grandmother. Uh, and my grandmother was absolutely amazing. I mean, I remember seeing her reading the Bible all day, every day. I remember her praying for uh, my sister and I, her grandchildren. And I remember her telling me about Jesus. The Price is Right days of our lives and reading the Bible became like the daily routine of living with my grandma. Um, I would wake up in the mornings and hear her, you know, praying and, and just singing praises to God and then, you know, smelling her cooking. And I remember after I went home that summer from spending that summer with my grandma, about two months later, actually, after I went home from that summer, my grandma fell ill. And so I remember my mom and I hopping in the car from Northern Virginia to North Carolina. And every weekend we would travel down from Northern Virginia to North Carolina to see my grandma in the hospital. And kind of going from seeing this beautiful, vibrant woman of God that would tell me the stories of how Jesus transformed her life and, you know, reading Bible stories to me and really kind of being that like safe haven for me and my faith at that time, kind of seeing her go from being a vibrant woman to tubes going down her throat and IVs hooked up to her in the hospital was really, it was really a shift. It was really alarming, kind of, you know. People may say, oh, you're 11, you know, you may not necessarily still understand what was going on, but no, I, I really understood the magnitude of what was going on. I remember seeing my mom 
who was a very strong uh, independent person at that time, and she still is, but very strong, um, with tears rolling down her face and seeing my aunts crying. And I remember being in the hospital trying to put the puzzle pieces together from my parents' divorce, my father leaving the house and not really seeing him like I used to, and now my grandmother's illness, and then, you know, she passed away. Fast forward uh, about four years later, during this time, well, in between that four years, I really began to deal with a lot of like depression and insecurities. Uh, There was a discipline that would take place in my house. And at the time, I felt like I was not loved as I wanted to be. I look back now and I see that, you know, that was just uh, the way that my mom best knew to discipline me. But at that age, I didn't I didn't really understand that. Also grappling still with my parents' divorce and my grandma's death, I began to get very depressed. The first suicidal thought that I had I was probably at the age of 12, um, wanting to kind of just not be around. Uh, But I remember still um, the words that my grandma would tell me. She would always tell me, no matter how you feel, Jesus is with you. So I actually started reading my Bible at the age of 12, but I still didn't yet have a relationship with Jesus for myself. I would. I still went to church. My mom still took my sister and I to church on the weekends and just throughout the week. But I did not have a relationship with Christ for myself. And that's when I look back now, and you can be in church all your life and still not know who Jesus is. And that's that was my story before I came to know who Christ was. So I remember feeling depressed, feeling suicidal from the age of 10 Um, all the way up to 15. And when I got in high school, I had met my a friend um, and he was absolutely amazing. He was a track runner. I ran track. We would warm up together. He would literally take off his jacket uh, so that I would not get my hair wet. He would take off his jacket when it was raining or even when it was cold and give it to me during track practice so that I wouldn't get my hair wet or 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 so that I would not be cold. And I remember walking in the hallways of our high school, and this guy would literally yell across the hallway, Janeva, like just to let me know that he saw me, that he knew me, and that somebody was taking notice of me. And that was something that I really needed uh, because at that time, I was still grappling with my parents' divorce, what was going on in my household and the discipline and my grandma's death. And so I I felt very insecure. I felt like I wasn't seen or heard. And so having that friend be able to come into my life and let me know that like somebody sees you, somebody knows you. Like if I was feeling down, this person would go out of their way to help me and kind of pull me out of those dumps. And I remember one day I had stayed after school for tutoring for my chemistry class. And my friend walked past me. I was leaving my chemistry class and this friend walked past me. And he had such anger in his eyes. And I remember saying his name and he just jotted past me like he didn't even see me. It was very alarming. It kind of left me perturbed because I was so used to him saying my name first when he saw me. And so to have him kind of dash past me with anger in his eyes, I knew something was off. I didn't go after him. And for the longest, I regretted not doing that. Um, But I didn't go after him because I was like, you know, maybe he's just upset. Let me just let him, you know, rock with it, let some steam off. And that was a Friday got home, you know, doing my thing at home, watching TV, doing homework. I come back to school on that Monday. I noticed I did not see him. That could have just been too because there was a lot of people at our school. So I sometimes didn't see him every day, but I would at least see him every other day. But I noticed I didn't see him. And that following Tuesday, the next day, I get to school and my teacher sits the class down and specifically talks to the friends of 
my friend, um, those in whom were very close to him. It was me and another guy in the class that were very close to him. And uh, she tells us that he had passed away. And I kind of didn't, I was numb when she said it because I was like, no, that's not him. There's somebody else by that name. It, it can't be him. And my friend, I looked at my other friend in the class who was also good friends with him. And I said, is she talking about like our friend? And then my friend said, yeah. And I remember my mouth just dropped and I I just, I, I couldn't, I couldn't understand because I was like this friend like what what happened I just I just talked to him the other week like what what happened and then I had another student come up to me in the class because he saw that I was distraught and he was like do you think somebody you know like harmed him or anything like that and I was like no I think he might have took his life the the guy in the class said why would you say that and I was like because this friend had no problem with anybody and he would go out of his way to make other people feel like they were seen and known. So I know nobody had anything against him. And I just remember actually being in school that day and I could not think properly. My teacher gave me a test and I ended up failing that test because all day I I just, I couldn't put the puzzle pieces together. I'm like, he's not here. Like, I, where is he at? Like, and I remember going home and I, I remember even just being at school and asking my mom, I'm like, mom, can I please, can I please just go home? And she's like, no, you're going to stay there at school. And I'm like, I, I need to go home. Like my mind is not where it should be. But, you know, I stayed at school. And when I got home, I remember going up to my mom's bathroom floor and I just, I just started crying. And I was like, you know, what happened? What's going on? And that night, I found a news article um, about what had took place with my friend. And, and the news article said that he had died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. And he was 15 at the time. And so here I am, still coping with my parents' divorce, my grandmother's death, you know, not seeing my dad as often. But I still called him, you know, my dad, because like I said, I was a big daddy's girl, still am. So I remember calling my dad that day and I was like, dad, like, he's not here. What do I do? Like, and my dad was just trying to encourage me, but still not being able to have my dad in that household. It's still, it, it, it was a lot. It, it really, it was hard. And, you know, my mom didn't really know how to, how to handle that situation. You know, like you have a 15 year old that, well, how do you handle that when your 15 year old, her best friend just died, right? And she doesn't even know like, you know, what to say. And so I kind of just suppressed and coped all those emotions. And I already felt depressed and suicidal, but after my friend died, I began to hear words and, and voices in my head telling me, your life is worth nothing. You should kill yourself. You're worth nothing. Your family doesn't even love you. They've abandoned you. Like all of these things, like lies from the enemy. But at that time, I didn't know that they were lies from the enemy because, like I said, I didn't have as strong of a relationship with the Lord as I do now. So I began to believe those voices. And I was hearing those voices all the time. And I began to feel that. I began to feel that nobody cares for me, nobody likes me, you know, all of these things. And so one day I was sitting in my home and those voices got louder. And so I walked upstairs into my mother's bathroom and she had had a knife in that bathroom from the week prior because she had cut some wires. So I knew that there was a knife there. I went into her bathroom. She wasn't at the house. My sister was on the other side of the house doing schoolwork. So I know I knew that my sister didn't really know what was going on with me. So I got into her bathroom and I locked the door. And I remember just hearing those voices even louder. And so I got on my knees and I grabbed the knife and I put the knife on my wrist and I was about to cut my wrist open. And all of a sudden, right when the knife was on my wrist and I was about to slash myself, I heard a voice say, stop. And I looked around the bathroom because it was such an audible voice. It was almost like somebody was in the bathroom with me. 
And I look around and I'm like, nobody's in this bathroom. What is going on? I pick up the knife because I, I got so shocked by the voice that I put the knife, like it, the knife came out of my hand because I was like, whoa, what was that? But I picked the knife up for a second time and I put it on my wrist again. And right before I was getting ready to cut my wrist open, I hear that voice again say, stop. And all of a sudden I just stopped. And I'm like, that has to be God. Because like I said, I knew about Jesus from, you know, growing up in church, but I didn't have a relationship with the Lord. So I knew that there was, that had to have been God. And I'll be honest, God still very much talks like he does in the, in the, in the old days, the, Bible, the the days of old where he talked so audibly to the prophets, he still very much does that till this day. I don't care what anybody says. And I heard that voice say, stop. I responded to the voice. I was like, what? And I heard the voice, when the voice said stop, it was, it was like a demanding type stop. But when the voice began to speak to me, it spoke to me in such a gentle, loving way. And it said, what are you getting ready to do? You're getting ready to take the very life that I gave you. I remember speaking back to the voice and I said, I don't want to be here anymore. My parents are divorced. I don't see my dad that often. My grandma's gone. And now the one friend that I did have that really showed me that I was I was noticed, that I, I felt like someone around this person, he's gone. And I couldn't even save him from him. I didn't even know he was going through that. And I heard that voice say, I was with you through all of that. And all of a sudden, I just felt, it felt like a physical blanket had fell on me. Like it, it felt so heavy, but yet it, it wasn't like a heaviness as in a weight, but it was like a, he- like, like a burden. It was like a heaviness as in a comfort. Like you put a heavy like blanket around you and you feel just warm, you feel comforted. That's how it was. And it was like a blanket of love that I had never felt before. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna cry. It was like a blanket of love that I had never felt before. And I told that voice, I said, I don't want to be in this place again. And it said, if you give yourself to me, if you give your life to me, I promise you'll never be here again. And all of a sudden, I just felt the loving arms of Jesus wrap around me. I said, yes. I said, yes to God. And when I got up from that bathroom floor, I just felt like a lifting off of me. I didn't come to accept Jesus as as my Lord and Savior in a church or at a revival. I came and accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior on my mom's bathroom floor when I was about to take my life. And I have seen that he's kept that promise. I've never been back to that place where I wanted to just end it all. There have been times where I have felt that spirit of depression try to come on to me or that spirit of heaviness try to come on to me. From then, that was in 2013, December 2013, I was 15. For about seven years, I battled with that spirit of depression. It never, I never got to a place where I wanted to take my life, but I got to that, that place where, you know, at times the enemy would try to make me feel like nobody cared or this and that. And immediately, like the word of the Lord says that we put on the garment of praise in exchange for the spirit of heaviness. And every time that I felt myself get in that rut of depression and heaviness, I would immediately begin to declare, Father God, you told me that when I was in this place of that that depressive state, that heaviness, that I won't go back to that. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And so I just began to, uh, you know, decree and declare the word of God over my life and put a praise on it. And I would feel that shift, that that heaviness come um, off of me. Um, But when God freed me from depression um, was in my prayer closet in September of 2020, I felt like a, a heaviness come on me when I woke up. 
And I remember going into uh, my prayer closet and I was like, okay, I don't like this. I'm feeling this. I, I got to get this off of me. And I began warring in prayer for a good like three hours. And all of a sudden, I just felt like a lift come off of me. I felt so much lighter. I think the last time I had felt that way was probably before my parents got a divorce when I was 10. About two summers later, in September of 2022, the enemy tried to tempt me back with that spirit of depression. I had ended up choosing a job um, where I was told all of the benefits, all of the things that I would get. And then when I got into the, the position, it was not what I thought it was. I uh, was dealing with a lot of gossip, a lot of backbiting um, from my coworkers, from my boss. I was told that I would end up getting, you know, going on certain trips and doing all these things. All of that was taken off. And all of a sudden, I just saw like, I, I just, the, the spirit of depression tried to come back onto me. And I told God, I was like, you know, Lord, I, I don't want to be like in this place where I'm feeling this. But I will say that I ended up, it's very important to listen to the Father and, and discern His voice. Because when I opened that door and I chose that job, I look back now and I realize that wasn't God leading me to choose that job. I wanted to choose that job because of what was told. Because of my disobedience, I allowed an open door um, to come in where I felt, you know, that 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 spirit of, of depression. But truly, God works all things together for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. So I remember in 2022, I had applied for literally 55 jobs to try to get out of this job. And I wasn't getting anything. But I remember um, just pressing into prayer one one day at a conference and the Lord had told me like, it'll be a quick thing, 100 days. And from that day, from 100 days that day, God had moved me out of that job, moved me from the area that I was in, moved me back to my hometown. I didn't want to move back to my hometown because I had, my mom and I did not have the strongest relationship. And I knew moving back to my hometown that I would be interacting with her. Uh, but it's, it's interesting because God had me to move back so that I could learn how to honor my mom and my father. I moved back to my hometown within that 100 days. I ended up getting another job. It wasn't the job that I had wanted originally. And I remember beating myself up for turning down the original job to take this other job. But God still did a mighty work in that. He still did a mighty work. About a year after I moved back, He brought back that very job that I had turned down at first to take this other job, he brought it back with a much higher salary and an even greater opportunity. And so God has showed me that all things God works together for, for our good. And he's also showed me that depression is a lie from the enemy. It really is. And I thank him that he met me on that bathroom floor because after that, that was when I was 15. Um, when I was getting ready to take my life. But at the age of 16, I preached my first sermon. And at the age of, from 16 to up in college, till I got to college, I was, a, I was evangelizing in my high school, telling people about the goodness of the Lord, telling them like how Jesus can save. And when I got to college, the Lord began to open up even more doorways where He blessed me to birth two campus ministries that uh, had a total of 220 students, men and women, um, that were a part of these campus ministries. And so even still to this day, God opens up doors where I begin, that I continue to evangelize. I'm 
a minister and I love to speak to young people because I understand that there is a calling on my generation, Generation Z, and God has called us to be a mouthpiece for Him. And suicide is the leading cause of death in my generation. But if anybody is listening and can hear this, I want to let you know that Jesus saves. He saves, He delivers, He heals, and He only He can take a dead girl and bring her back to life. I was dead in my sin. I was I was depressed. I was suicidal. I was insecure. And and he at that time when I was on that bathroom floor, he took me and brought me from that pit season into a palace and he speaks to me and he tells me how I'm loved and he uses me to be a mouthpiece. If the enemy had his way, those souls that God has led me to reach in college, those souls that God's continuing to lead me to reach, they may have not been reached through me if the enemy had had his way, but God saves and God delivers and he is mighty. And so anybody that is listening, I want to let you guys know If you're dealing with depression, if you're dealing with suicide, truly greater is he that is within you than anything that is in the world. Depression is deception. It is a lie from the enemy. And greater, truly greater, God has given us and truly greater is within us. So I think now, I look back now, and in those moments where that spirit of depression tries to come upon me, In those moments where that spirit of heaviness tries to come upon me, the Lord reminds me, Janeva, I am that God that took you from that place, that God that that took you from that area where you felt abandoned, where you felt like nobody saw you or nobody heard you, to this young lady where you're a mouthpiece for me. And you are amazing and you are great. And all of a sudden, I just begin to put a praise on it when I feel that spirit of heaviness. And I feel that lifting. I feel that lifting. Jesus specializes in bringing dead things back to life. He specializes in taking that person that is heavy-hearted, that person that is depressed, That person that feels like nobody sees them and nobody hears them and nobody loves them. I want you to know that the devil is a liar. God sees you. He knows you. He hears you. And at times when I reflect on my parents' divorce, on my grandmother's death, on my good friend's suicide, I'm reminded of the words that he told me when I was on that bathroom floor that he was with me through it all. And even through all of this, he is with you through it all. Geneva, you mentioned one of the areas, you mentioned to me, one of the areas where God is using you is spoken word. And uh, you had a spoken word that you wanted to share with people who are watching today. It deals with your testimony. I wanted to give you the opportunity to share that word for those who are watching right now. So one of the things that God has gifted me with is spoken word. And I, I, he told me to write a, a poem, a spoken word piece uh, to relay of my testimony to his people. Um, and so, yeah. Mm-hmm. Depression and suicidal thoughts became what I knew. Loneliness, confusion, and fear were ever so true. Hundreds surrounding me, but I still felt alone. I thought no one understood. I believed I was on my own. I was 15 years old when my friend died and seeing him laying in that casket, I nearly lost my mind, but I put a smile on my face and pretended like everything was okay. Demons taunting me and my head ending, whispering, end it all, today is the day. So I finally listened and picked up a knife, ready to cut my wrist open the only way I thought to heal a heart that was broken. I was about to cut myself and bleed out. That's when I heard a voice call out to me in a shout. It said, stop. What are you getting ready to do? Please don't take the life that I gave you. When I heard that voice, I stopped 
because I didn't know what it was, but I was still determined to see the end through. So I picked up the knife and put it on my wrist for a second time. That's when I heard the voice call out to me and it was like no other, it was one of a kind. Every voice that had tormented me and my head stopped when this one spoke. It had authority, compassion, and love, and at that moment, I awoke. Please, it said, what are you getting ready to do? I responded, I'm ending it all, I'm throwing in the towel, I'm through. That's when it said, I know how you feel. Garden of Gethsemane, I've been there too. That's when I felt the loving arms of Jesus wrap around me like a weighted blanket. I was 15 years old on the bathroom floor rescued from the hand of Satan. It was then that I decided to give my life to Jesus, but life still wasn't easy. Matter of fact, depression still creeps in and I go to on and off therapy. But thanks be to Jesus who saved my life. He is setting me free. Jesus Christ continues to deliver me from depression. Only Jesus can heal and save, that's no question. Y'all, I'm confessing that there's no other name under heaven that can remove every transgression and bring forth progression. Thanks be to Jesus who comes to bring new life. He's the Lamb of God, the holy sacrifice. He died on the cross and rose from the grave. It is by his blood that we are all saved. This poem ain't for fame. This poem is to inspire. So I pray it sparks a flame on the inside of you and ignites a Holy Ghost fire. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I dedicate the rest of my life to bringing glory to your name. No one and nothing will ever be able to extinguish this fire. Because Jesus Christ lit the flame. Janeva, who is Jesus to you? Jesus is my everything. I know it may sound cliche, but I mean it. He's my everything. He is my life, my source, my, my resource, everything. I said this the other day that if I can't have him in my life, there is no point of me being alive. Like he is literally everything and more that I could imagine. Everything that I need, that friend, that parent, that resource, that provision, he is everything to me. Can you pray for those who are watching, Geneva, that are connecting with your testimony and maybe feel like they're ready to take their life away and they don't know what to do. Could you just pray as they are watching right now? Yes. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for my brother and my sister who are watching this on the other line. God, I thank you that you see them, that you know them, and that you love them. Lord, you said in your word that no weapon formed against us will prosper, and any tongue that rises up against us, it's condemned. So, Father, right now, we condemn every spirit of depression, every spirit of heaviness, every spirit of loneliness, abandonment, suicide, rejection, and neglection. We command it into the pits of hell. And Father God, I lose joy over that person that is feeling heavy, over that person that is feeling depressed. God, I lose joy over them. And I pray, Father God, that you meet them as you met me and remind them and tell them that their identity is found in you and you alone. Own. God, I thank you that victory is their portion and they will live and not die and see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. God, I pray for that person that goes to sleep at night and cries themselves to sleep. I pray for that parent, that teenager, that young adult that feels like Nobody sees them. Nobody hears them. Nobody knows them. I pray for that adult that has that heaviness on their shoulders. God, I thank you that you see them, that you know them, and you've encamped an army of angels around them. So show them that there is more fighting for them than against them. Cover them by the blood, your blood, Jesus. 
And we thank you. I thank you for what you are doing in their lives. And great is their reward. May they press on toward the mark of the high calling to attain the prize that you have called them to attain in Christ Jesus. In your name, I pray. Amen.